Historian Bernard Lewis is the author of What Went Wrong, Western Impact and Middle Eastern Response, arguing that Islamic civilization, once flourishing and tolerant, has in modern times become stagnant. Next, we'll bring you his recent appearance at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., with former Pakistani ambassador to England, Akbar Ahmed, author of Islam Today. Mr. Ahmed's book explores how the Muslim minorities in the West struggle to maintain their identities and ideals in uncomprehending or hostile environments. It's an hour, 25 minutes. Now for the introductions. Bernard Lewis, the Cleveland E. Dodge professor of Near Eastern Studies Emeritus at Princeton University, has been called the patriarch of all Islamicists. The author of more than two dozen books, Professor Lewis was born and educated in London and received his PhD at the University of London. He has been a professor at Princeton since 1974. In 1990, he was the Jefferson Lecturer for the National Endowment for the Humanities, and in 1998 was awarded the Ataturk Peace Prize. A member of the British Intelligence Service during World War II, Mr. Lewis has been an informal advisor to top foreign policy officials in Britain and the United States. His current book, What Went Wrong, has spent the past 10 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Akbar Ahmed is the Ibn Khaldun, I should have asked you earlier, Chair of Islamic Studies and Professor of International Relations at American University. Prior to coming to American, Professor Ahmed was a visiting professor at Princeton and held appointments at Harvard University and Cambridge University. He held several senior positions in the government of Pakistan, including the Pakistan High Commission, the equivalent of the ambassador to the United Kingdom. He's also the author of numerous books on contemporary Islam, one of which was the basis for a six-part series by the BBC. His book, Islam Today, has been hailed as one of the best nonfiction books of the year by the Los Angeles Times. We'll start with Professor Lewis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Is this working all right? No. It is. <laughs> I, I've learned by experience that it's wise to ask that question. Thank you. Um, let me begin with a word of uh, explanation. The book is not, as the title might seem to indicate, a discussion of what happened on September the 11th and what followed. The book was already in page proof on September the 11th. So I cannot pretend that it offers any inside story of those events and their consequences. I think I can, however, perhaps offer some guidance on the sequence of events that led to what happened on September the 11th. Time is short, so let me try to explain briefly what I tried to do in this book. Ed, can you turn that up a little bit? Into this one? Try to try talking to this one. Is that any better? Oh. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> that is obviously better. Is that all right now? Good. Um, let me explain what I tried to do in this book. <clears throat> and before that, oh, another word of explanation is needed. We use the word Islam in English and other Western languages in two distinct though related senses. It is the equivalent of Christianity, that is to say, the name of a religion in the strict sense, a system of belief and worship. It is also the equivalent of Christendom, the name of a civilization shaped by that religion, but including a great deal other than that religion. Uh, the late Marshall Hodgson of Chicago University, who, as far as I know, was the first to draw attention to this possible source of confusion, suggested that in the second sense, we should use the word Islamdom. An excellent suggestion, which, not surprisingly, was not really adopted. It's a difficult word to say, I think you'll agree. So we are still left with this potential confusion, um, which can be quite serious. For example, if you say Christian art, you will understand art related to worship, church art and the like. If you say Islamic art, you would normally mean the entire art production in the lands of Muslim civilization 
irrespective of whether they are what in Western terms would be called sacred or profane. When we talk of Islamic science, we mean chemistry, biology, mathematics, and all the rest of it produced in the lands of Islamic civilization. We don't call Western or Christian biology and mathematics Christian science. That term is used for quite a different purpose. I mention this because I think it's important to understand the possible confusions that may arise when talking of Islam. When I talk of Islam in the few minutes that remain to me, I shall be using the word principally in the second sense, the name of a civilization, rather than specifically the name of a system of belief and worship. That civilization, I think most historians would agree, in the days of its greatness, was in most respects the most advanced, the most creative, the most free that the world had until then ever known. It was in the forefront of virtually every significant field of human endeavor, in the sciences, in mathematics, in physics, in chemistry, in astronomy, you name it, in the arts, in literature, in music, uh, in architecture, and so on. It was also the most powerful military power in the world. Its armies were simultaneously operating in France, where having conquered Spain, they crossed the Pyrenees. In Africa, where having conquered the whole of the north, they were extending southwards. In Asia, where they were entering both India and China at different times. Far and away, the most powerful civilization, state, empire, whatever you choose to call it, in the world. This military power was matched by an economic power and sophistication. A rich economic life, many manufacturers, and I may mention in passing, they also developed uh, an elaborate and sophisticated system of finance and banking. And as they used to say in Moscow, it is no accident that a fair part of our vocabulary in these matters comes from Arabic or Persian sources. Um, the words check, for example, and tariff are of Middle Eastern origin. One could add others. And then, suddenly, things went wrong. I say suddenly because it seemed that way. Obviously, historically, in a larger historical and global perspective, this was a gradual process. But few people, <clears throat> when things are actually happening, can manage a global or historical perspective. They judge in terms of their own immediate experience. It is true that for a while things had been going badly at the extremities of the Islamic world. The Moors were expelled from Spain, the Tatars were expelled from Russia, West Europeans were arriving in South and Southeast Asia. But all this seemed remote and marginal. At the center, the last the most enduring and in many ways the greatest of all the Islamic states, the Ottoman Empire, was still thriving and flourishing and advancing in Europe against its obvious natural enemy, the Holy Roman Empire, which played a similar role in Christendom. Continuing the rivalry between the two religions that had been going on for a millennium. In the 17th century, Islamic power in Europe was still very considerable. Turkish pashas were still governing in Budapest and in Belgrade. Turkish armies were besieging Vienna. Uh, corsairs from North Africa were raiding the coasts of Europe, even as far away as England and Ireland, and on one occasion, Iceland, an event which is still commemorated in Icelandic history as the major event of their entire island history between the arrival of the Vikings and the arrival of the Allied forces in World War II. <clears throat> and then, as I say, there was a sudden dramatic awareness that things had gone wrong. The turning point was the second Turkish siege of Vienna in 1683. The Turkish historian of the time, Selektal, with commendable frankness, writes, this was a calamitous defeat, the worst that we have known since the foundation of the Ottoman state. I wish more modern Middle Eastern historians could muster similar candor in discussing events. 
Um, this was followed by a headlong retreat through the Balkans and a peace treaty, the Treaty of 1699, the first imposed on the Ottomans by victorious Christian enemies. So, just over 300 years ago, the debate began. What went wrong? Why is it that in the past we were always victorious, now the Christians, or more frequently the infidels, are always victorious? The debate began, as you would expect, in the Ottoman elite the political, military, bureaucratic elite. But it spread from there to wider elements of the Turkish population and it spread from Turkey to other countries in the Islamic world. As the defeat by the walls of Vienna was followed by other defeats on all the frontiers of Islam and the Treaty of Karlovitz of 1699 was followed by other treaties imposing the will of the West on the Islamic world. As I say, this was something of which they were well aware. And the main theme of my book is the discussion. What I try to do is not so much offer my own explanations of what went wrong, but to try to explain how they saw it, what they said about it, what they thought about it. And uh, how much time do I have left? Yeah. I, can do, I can do no more than mention headings. Obviously, the first one was military. The, the, the change was first made apparent by military defeat, so you look for military remedies. Didn't work. Then they saw the change as economic. Defeats on the battlefield were followed by defeats in the marketplace. So they looked to industry, to manufacturers, to finance as the secret of Western greatness. Then some looked for what is most peculiarly and distinctively Western that could be the secret talisman of Western power. And the thing which was most distinctly different was parliamentary government, constitutions, elected assemblies, and all that nonsense. <laughs> and attempts were made in one country after another to install this kind of government and with one exception, they don't seem to have worked very well. A Turkish writer of the mid-19th century, Namek Kemal, offers another explanation. In an article published in the mid-century in a Turkish newspaper, he says, the main reason for our failure to keep up with the Western world is the way we treat our women. He said, he uses two striking images. In the first one, he says, at best, we treat our women like jewels or musical instruments. I think a very vivid and striking metaphor. At worst, of course, in a lot of other ways. And by the way we treat our women, he says, depriving ourselves of the talents and services of half the population. Our society is like a human body that is paralyzed on one side. He then points to a further difficulty that these depressed and downtrodden and ignorant women are also the mothers of even the male half, so that it's both sides of the population that are affected by this. These are some of the explanations. Many others have been offered since. Broadly, they fall into two categories. When you, ask, when you become aware that something is wrong, where do you go from there? Well, what I've been describing so far is the line, what did we do wrong? Which, of course, leads naturally to the next question, how do we put it right? But there is another way of saying, who did this to us? Which may lead into serious discussions, but more often leads to neurotic fantasies and conspiracy theories, and explanations which are really not causes, but symptoms. Let me just take one, and then I'll conclude. At one time, a favorite explanation of the decline and fall of classical Islamic civilization was the Mongol invasions, which destroyed the caliphate in the mid-13th century. But later, historians in the Arab world have pointed out that if a few thousand nomadic horsemen riding across the steppe from East Asia could overthrow the mighty caliphate of Baghdad, there must have been something wrong with the caliphate of Baghdad. And I think the same may be said of other explanations of that type. I'll pause at that point. Okay. 
belonging to the civilization, which somehow asks the questions about what went wrong, I began to write this book several years ago. This is the reason I wrote it, and I will read out the last paragraph of the book to give you an idea of what I was thinking as a social scientist, and which in a sense, in a terrible, horrible sense, lays the grounds for September and the explosion that we saw on that uh, fateful day. The book itself was dedicated to Ibrahim, my grandson, and this is what it says. The book is dedicated with love to Ibrahim Khan Hoti, my grandson. Ibrahim was born late in 1998 and will live as a Muslim in the first century of the new Christian millennium. I pray that this small book and his name in memory of the great prophet act as a point of contact between different peoples and traditions and will be a source of strength and inspiration to him in a world increasingly divided and often violent. That is how the book opens and this is how it ends. The major problems that cause so much anger and distress among Muslims need to be addressed. Those of the Bosnians and Kosovans in Europe, the Palestinians in the Middle East, and the Kashmiris in South Asia, for example. The routine beatings, torture, and killings must stop. Life has become hell on earth for these Muslims. The West must illustrate to the Muslims that justice will be done in these cases that the United Nations does not act only to hammer its enemies. In turn, Muslims must convince the world that the media images of them as law-breaking and violent people are not true. That foreign embassies, diplomats, travelers, and non-Muslims are safe in their countries. These acts are one way of capturing the headlines, but they are not Islamic in content or spirit. The fight against injustice and oppression must continue, but must take other forms. The above points will assist understanding and tolerance. It is in this hope that I worked on this book. What comes from the lips reaches the ears. What comes from the heart reaches the heart, says an Arab proverb. I hope that this book will reach the heart. Now, I wrote this book, in fact, began to write it several years ago, and in a sense, it is a debate both within Muslim society and outside it, precisely with distinguished and eminent historians like my distinguished colleague, Professor Bernard Lewis. In fact, when I was coming here, some colleagues said, oh, I expect this to be a clash of civilizations between you and Bernard Lewis. And I said, oh, you'll be disappointed. This is going to be a dialogue of civilizations. That's how I see it. Now, the question that Bernard has raised and I may be jumping a little bit, but I do want to take this as the heart of uh, this evening, what went wrong, has a certain final ring to it. My objection is as a, an anthropologist, as a social scientist engaging with a historian, for me, the relevant question is, what is going wrong? It is this tense that is crucial. What is going wrong in a society which has features like justice, knowledge, compassion at its heart, that is the Islamic ideal. And yet we are seeing the violence, the suicide bombers, September 11, where is the element of justice or compassion in these indiscriminate acts of violence? Something is going wrong. That is what I need to address. The linear description of history that uh, my colleague Professor Bernard Lewis has so eloquently laid out, for me as someone from South Asia, does not hold. Again, I object to it in terms of methodology. When history appears to be coming to an end, very rightly, as uh, Professor Lewis points out, for much of the Muslim world, for me in South Asia, in the middle of the 19th century, history is just beginning. Just see what happens in South Asia. Aligarh University, one of the great educational institutions of the world, is created. It creates, in turn, generations of scientists and writers and presidents and prime ministers in South Asia. Mirza Ghalib, one of the greatest poets of the Muslim world, is just writing his poetry. A century later, Iqbal, one of the greatest poets of the 20th century, great poet philosopher, is writing his poetry in the 20th century. And finally, one of the most dynamic political movements of the 20th century that is the movement for the creation of Pakistan 
begins in the 1930s and 1940s. No, Muslim, is not, Muslim history is not ending for me. Muslim history is just beginning in the middle of the 20th century. And that movement is headed by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, a Democrat. The question about democracy and Islam. When given a choice, the people of South Asia want a Democrat, a liberal humanist who believes in women's rights, minority rights, who believes in the Constitution, he leads them. And the people of the South Asian Muslim community follow Mr. Jinnah and his vision of a modern democratic Pakistan. Then the impact in terms of culture, again, one argument is that Muslims have not made an impact in terms of culture or intellectual achievement. We have a Nobel Prize winner, a physicist from Pakistan, Nusrat Fateh Ali, the great mystical Sufic poet and singer, made such an impact that Hollywood films like The Last Temptation of Christ have soundtracks based on his music. So there is no limitation to the vitality, the creativity of Muslim society. I would rather see this as cyclical. I would go back to another colleague of Bernard's, Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun, the person whose chair I hold, named after the, the great uh, Arab social scientist and historian, that history, in a sense, is a consequence of the integration and disintegration of society at a certain level. What I see is what is going wrong in the Muslim world is that particular disintegration taking place at a certain level of society. And I believe the way forward, and this is the next question that we both raise, where, we, where are we going? Where are we needing to be able to plan out the, the chart, uh, the, the landscape, the route for the 21st century in, in the hope that we have to live together as human societies? I believe that the first most important step is that of mutual understanding in terms of simple dialogue. Without this understanding, there can be no movement forward. We will then have, unfortunately, acts of terror, acts of misunderstanding, acts of conflict. And this dialogue, this understanding, can only come with the exchanges that we are seeing this evening. And here, I would like to pay a long overdue tribute to Bernard Lewis. I know that many Muslims are sensitive to his work and overly sensitive to his criticism. But I believe constructive criticism must be accepted in the Muslim world by Muslim academics. We must be robust enough to face this and engage in dialogue and prepare answers. I believe the first crucial steps for Muslim society are threefold. Number one, education. Education is an absolute priority in a society where knowledge is given the highest, highest status in the Muslim agenda. It is so high in priority that the word for knowledge, which is ilm, is the second most used word in the holy book, the Quran, for the Muslims. And yet you see the reality of Muslim education. So knowledge, and knowledge in the broadest, truest sense, not narrow, not confined. Secondly, democracy. Democracy must be encouraged by Muslims and non-Muslims. However imperfect its realization in the Muslim world, and it's not been a great success, I agree with Bernard, nonetheless, it has to be given a chance. Again, go back to Pakistan. 1947, when the country came into being, it came with a lot of hopes, not only in South Asia, but throughout the Muslim world. Had it worked, you would have had a beacon of democracy in the Muslim world. People in Pakistan still want democracy. People in Bangladesh still want democracy. These are Muslim lands. They have voted for women prime ministers. There is hope. When given a choice, the people of Pakistan will not vote for religious leaders. They've never voted more than five or six seats in parliament for religious leaders. They've always voted for democracy. So we have to make sure that we remain on that particular path. Thirdly, and this is a more difficult, more amorphous suggestion or point, that is really the perception that we have of each other, the Muslim world and the Western world. And right now, I believe it's at one of its lowest points in the graph. And that is why this dialogue, this exchange becomes absolutely crucial. The suggestion to nuke Mecca has not gone down very well in the Muslim world. It has shocked the Muslim world. How would they... What would the reaction be in Catholic service, uh, circles if someone suggested nuking the Vatican? There would be an outrage. Or similar suggestions for other civilizations. Yet, 
these are suggestions which are not marginal. Editors of national papers or journals are making these suggestions. People are calling the Muslim faith wicked, the Muslim faith evil. Well, as Bernard has pointed out, there is the Islamic faith and they are the acts of individual Muslim people. You cannot equate the two. They are good people, they're bad people in every civilization and in every religion. So I would urge you that this third point, which is how to tackle the media, how to tackle the media which is very often simplistic and very often misleading and very often their perceptions are rooted in ignorance, in hatred, in simple prejudice. How do we tackle this? This answer must come both from the West and the Muslim world. Finally, we need to remember the Muslim citizens in America. There's something like seven million Muslims in America. These are citizens, these are Americans, these are loyal Americans, Muslims who love America. What is happening to them? Why are they not being used as ambassadors between the West and the Islamic world? I think they could act as a natural, cultural, traditional, intellectual bridge between the two positions. And answer this question, why do they hate us? The Muslims of America can go to the Muslim world and explain what America is, what America stands for. And that, in fact, the war against terrorism is that. It is a war against terrorism, not a war against Islam. And we are conscious that from President Bush to Tony Blair, the Prime Minister of Britain, the leaders of the Western world have constantly pointed out that it is not a war against Islam however much many people in the Muslim world may see it as such. So it is crucial that we think about this particular point. I will end by quoting the philosophy which underlines both this book Islam Today and the other book of mine which you have outside called Discovering Islam, which is the philosophy of sul -e kul sul -e kul means peace with all. Now, this is the philosophy, not post-September, not suddenly discovered after the conflict and the global crisis that has plunged our human civilization, but this is the philosophy a thousand years old of the great Sufi sages and scholars of the Muslim world. Peace with all. People who see the other great Abrahamic faiths as part of their own tradition. People who believe that we are all created by the same divine person, being, oneness, people who believe that ultimately we are part of the same civilization and Muslims who reflect the last great address of the Holy Prophet of Islam in which he said there is neither white nor black nor Arab nor non-Arab and you're only to be judged on the basis of your good deeds and good acts. I think that's a great charter to keep in mind in the 21st century because it will be a century of the clash of civilizations and I believe it's crucial that we hang on, however tenuous, however, however amorphous the ideas of the dialogue of civilizations, I believe it's an important one to hang on to. Thank you. Before we get to the uh, questions and answers, uh, Professor Lewis, uh, Professor Ahmed commented a little bit about your book. Uh, would you, I know you haven't had a chance to uh, fully read it, but if you would comment a little bit about uh, Professor Ahmed's book and his points, mm -hmm. and I'll ask Professor Ahmed to comment a, bit, a little bit more on yours. Yes. <clears throat> I must confess that I have not had a, the opportunity to study the book with the care and attention that it deserves. I've been away for several months. I've only been back for a few days, and I'm still struggling to catch up with the accumulated arrears of correspondence and other chores. However, I do have the advantage of being acquainted with his previous work, and that enabled me to get perhaps rather more out of a cursory examination than I might otherwise have done. During the last few months, we have, I think it would not be unfair to say, we have literally been inundated with nonsense about Islam. Some of it from Muslims, most of it from non-Muslims. Nonsense of two kinds. On the one hand, the kind that presents Islam as, as a religion of bloodthirsty barbarians, pursuers of some primitive tribal god, dedicated to nothing but warfare and so on. The other presents Islam as a religion 
of love and peace, rather like the Quakers, but without their aggression. <laughs> Both of these can be and have been supported by artfully chosen excerpts from Quranic and other Islamic texts, which by removing the context and removing what goes before and comes after, can be used to support either of these presentations. And both, of course, are absurd. And the truth in this, as in most matters, is in its usual place, somewhere between the extremes. Uh, as Professor Ahmed has pointed out, his approach is different from mine, in that he is a social scientist, an anthropologist, I am a historian. And we use the word history in a number of different senses, and I would like to clarify what I mean by it. History is what happened. History is the traces or records or documents left by what happened. History is the scholarly study of those traces or records or documents, what historians call sources. And history is what I think it is nowadays fashionable to call the narrative based on that study, or as is often the case nowadays, based on pure imagination. Professor Ahmed's approach is quite different. It is that of the social scientist who proceeds through minute and close observation. And his presentation is therefore, I think, a valuable corrective to what may be the one-sided view of the historian. It's not always the same side. If you read two or more historians, you will get two or more sides. But even so, they all write as historians. And therefore, I would strongly recommend a study of the social science aspect based on close and direct knowledge and, shall we say, communication. We also differ in another important respect. Perhaps I can explain this by telling you an anecdote. In 1957, I went on a visit to Pakistan, where I had the unique privilege of being invited to tea by Mulana Maududi, the great Islamic teacher. And he was a gracious host, and we talked of this and that. And then at one point he said, you Orientalists, you all make the same mistake. And I braced myself, thinking, no, here it comes. <laughs> but I was quite wrong. That wasn't his point at all. He said, you all of you learn Arabic, some of you learn Persian, a few of you learn Turkish, and you think that with that you can understand Islam. You are quite mistaken and your view is totally out of date. Today the center of Islam is here. This conversation took place in Lahore, I should imagine. And in order to understand present day Islam, you must know Urdu, Arabic and Persian and Turkish will only help you understand the past. <laughs> A very interesting and, uh, for me, extremely enlightening uh, introduction. That is the other point of difference. My Islam is basically the Middle East with vague extensions into North Africa and Central Asia. I have visited the Muslim countries of South and Southeast Asia, but I don't know their languages, which is, of course, a crippling deficiency. I can only read what they write in English and that is always filtered. And therefore, again, from this point of view, I think that um, Professor Ahmad's introduction to South Asian Islam, and may I throw in Southeast Asian Islam, is a particular value. Um, Thank you. Yes. Professor Ahmed? Yes, I'd like to um, continue from where Professor Lewis uh, left off which is to try to look at what is going wrong in Muslim society. And uh, I, of course, very much want uh, Professor Lewis's response to this. This is how I see it. If, if you look at it from the Muslim point of view, and if you rest your belief in the divine book, and you accept that this is how God created history, humanity, then this is what God, and assuming that uh, we can um, ascend to that position and look down on us from, from uh, up, up there, this is how God would be seeing it. God creates human civilization, that's um, a human civilization with two categories of commands. 
one category in which God says, look, I expect you to say prayers, I expect you to fast, I expect you to remember me. So that is a relationship between me and you as an individual. One category. The second category is between you and your fellow man and woman. In the second category, you must have justice. You must have compassion for one another. You must acquire knowledge so it allows you to understand other people. The Quran says there's a verse. You must know one another. We have made you into tribes and nations so that you get to know one another. It's a wonderful verse for an anthropologist. It's, an, it's a, a blank check to go and study other societies. So here we have two distinct categories of behavior in the Muslim world. First, God, man slash woman. Second, man and man. Two different categories. Now what I believe is happening is that while Muslims are able to implement the first set, the five pillars of Islam, that is that they acknowledge the uh, oneness of God, they can say their prayers, they can fast, they can give zakat and so on. The second category which is justice, compassion, the acquisition of knowledge is far from perfect. That is imperfect, incomplete, frustrated, thwarted. Now, what are the consequences of this? The consequences are that while at the one and the same time you can get someone like the Taliban, groups like the Taliban, able to implement the items in the first category, they are failing completely in the second category. Therefore, we see their behavior, which is inexplicable to me as a social scientist. They say their prayers, they think of God, and yet they're beating up women, they're locking up women, they're beating up minorities. It doesn't make sense unless you're able to explain it in the conceptual frame that I have laid out this evening. And when you are able to understand this conceptual frame, you're able to partly understand what is going wrong in Muslim society. So to recreate, to recreate an element of a vision in Muslim society, we need to be recreating the sense of compassion, the sense of justice, the sense of respect for learning in the Muslim world. Too often, too often we hear about Muslim scholars who are silenced or humiliated or chased out of the Muslim world. It's a collapse of Muslim scholarship. Again, there are consequences of this. A vacuum is created in society. And when a vacuum is created in society, what do you have? You have, as Bernard Lewis said, all kinds of people coming up and speaking on behalf of Islam. And they have simplistic answers. One answer is take a gun or a bomb or a grenade and go and throw it at people. And that is Islam. It is happening because of the second category of what God wants, injunctions, ideas, um, uh, exhortations that are collapsing in the Muslim world. Uh, we're going to ask for uh, members of the audience to uh, line up at the microphones and uh, before, uh, as you're doing that, I will ask the, uh, the first question. Uh, Professor Lewis, you mentioned that you have been accused of being an Orientalist. Uh, what do you say to that? And Professor uh, Ahmed, uh, I don't know if you've been accused of it, but in having read your book, one might say that you are an apologist. Uh, and could you respond to that? So, Professor Lewis? Well, uh, if you permit me, I will approach this historically. It's the only way that I know. Um, the term Orientalist came into use among European scholars when they started to study Arabic and later other classical Oriental languages using the philological technique and method that they had perfected for the study of Latin and Greek. It arises from the scholarship of the Renaissance, the meticulous scientific, I think one may use that word, study of Latin and Greek texts. The methods that they evolved, they then applied first to the Hebrew text of the Old Testament and then to other Oriental languages, first Arabic, later Persian, Sanskrit and others. Um, the word Orientalist was originally used in precisely the same way that the words Latinist and Hellenist were used to indicate a form of scholarship and to indicate the particular area or culture with which this group of scholars concerned. That remained the normal, indeed, the, almost the only use of the term until quite recently. There was one other use. It was used to designate a school of European painters 
mostly French, some Italian, who painted scenes from a mostly imaginary Orient. And this is known as the Orientalist painting. I don't know of any connection between the two. Um, certainly the painters concerned were not Orientalist scholars. The Orientalist literature goes back quite a long way. It goes back almost as far as printing in Europe and in a sense even further. European scholars, uniquely in human history, were interested in other civilizations. This doesn't happen otherwise. The Chinese civilization in its great age never showed the slightest interest in any other part of Asia. The same is true of ancient India. Uh, the same is true of the Greeks and Romans. The Greeks had a little interest, but not very much. The same is true of classical Islam in its great age. They ruled Spain, or parts of Spain, for 800 years and never had the interest to learn Latin or Spanish. The Turks ruled parts of southeastern Europe for half a millennium and never showed the slightest interest in the languages or cultures of those countries. It was they who were being normal, a Europe that was being abnormal, in this desire to learn about other civilizations. And obviously, those who don't share that kind of curiosity have difficulty in understanding it and attribute to it base motives. Uh, if I may quote the immortal Dr. Johnson, writing in the 18th century, he says, there is no topic, I'm quoting from memory, so it may not be verbatim, but I think the thrust will be correct. There is no subject in which human curiosity is more usefully or more agreeably exercised than in studying the laws and customs of alien nations. And then some years later, he added a second clause. He said, the only two that are worth studying are Christendom and Islam. All the rest are hopeless barbarians. Uh, that showed his limitations. But it's interesting that already in the 18th century, he was willing to include Islam on a par with Christendom. Um, the term Orientalist was used in that sense until the mid-50s, when it was attacked from two sides. On the one hand, it was attacked by the Orientalists, who felt that this term was no longer adequate and could be misleading. It was felt the term, what the term Orientalist is too vague. One, in that it doesn't indicate the place. Everything from Morocco to Japan could come under it. And two, that it doesn't indicate the discipline. It brings together historians, linguists, linguists literary scholars, philologists, and you name it. And therefore, at the International Congress of Orientalists, which met in Paris in um, 57, I think it was, the term Orientalist was formally abolished. And the International Organization of Orientalists, on its 100th anniversary, renamed itself Organization of the Human Sciences with special reference to Asia and Africa. Um, a loss in brevity, but a gain in accuracy. And the term Orientalist was consigned to the garbage heap. But you know, garbage heaps are not safe places. There are people who go rummaging in them looking for things that they can use. <laughs> and uh, there's no need for me to go into details. But there were other persons who found this term and decided they could give it another value, a much more negative one, um, indicating not an intelligent curiosity in other civilizations, but a kind of predatory design on other civilizations. So that, for example, let me try to choose a carefully neutral example. Um, the, the literature and history of the Eskimos is the exclusive, exclusive property of the Eskimos, and for anyone else to study it is an intrusion and an invasion. OK. Um, Larry, in response to your question, I think it's a difficult time to be a Muslim scholar. I agree with you. Uh, a Muslim scholar is by definition defensive. A Muslim scholar switches on the news and he sees so much in the news about his religion, his culture, his civilization. <coughs> so much of it is, as Professor Lewis rightly pointed out, based in ignorance and prejudice. So it is a difficult time. It's a difficult time because as a scholar, 
you must point out what is right and what is wrong. And as an, a trained anthropologist, in fact, I have a PhD from uh, the school associated with Bernard Lewis, which is the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. I have to base whatever I write on hard fact. This is the work of the anthropologist. We have our own data, we have our own observations, and we write uh, about what we see. At the same time, with the emotions that are being aroused both within Muslim society and outside it, it becomes very difficult to be seen as neutral. For instance, when I was asked uh, to be on the Oprah Winfrey show, and I went there, and uh, for me it was a new cultural experience, and certainly did it wonders, <laughs> wonders for this book. When I got back, a lot of Muslims were accusatory. They said, you've sold out. And I said, sold out, what do you mean? Here, here for once, this uh, main cultural icon of America is introducing Islam to a mainstream American audience. And they said, no, we shouldn't be interacting, we shouldn't have dialogue. So there is that kind of defensiveness, unfortunately, in some quarters in the Muslim world. Now, a similar aggressiveness, a similar ignorance exists in non-Muslims. So if I say that Islam is a religion of peace, they will say, this is nonsense. This is just not true. If I say that out of the 99 names of God, the two greatest, most repeated names are Rahman and Rahim, which mean compassion and mercy. And that for me as a Muslim, if my God is the God of Judaism and Christianity is the God of mercy and compassion, then I believe my religion is a religion of mercy and compassion. People will, won't believe it because they'll say Islam means extremism, it means terrorism, it means fundamentalism. So it's a very difficult difficult time. At the same time, my work is based on social science, which means I go back to the great traditions in my discipline. In fact, there are great Muslim figures. I quoted Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun's significance in the history of knowledge is that he's the first Muslim social scientist to talk of cause and effect. He's not simply recounting a series of names or events or dynasties. For the first time, he's saying, if this happens in society, this will be the consequence. And in a sense, in a sense, he predates, uh, there's, there's an echo of him in the work of the great modern masters, where there's Karl Marx or Max Weber or Pareto, there's a reflection of what Khaldun said in the 13th and 14th centuries. So I have a tradition to fall back to. I have the privilege, the good fortune to be interacting with some of the finest universities in the Western world, and I hope that this work, in turn, has an impact in the Muslim world. So, a difficult time for a Muslim scholar, one is called all sorts of names, but a critical time, where I believe that even a small impact, a small dent, is worth it in these very difficult times. Okay. We have uh, a lot of people here, a lot of people want to ask questions, so I'm going to enforce the uh, ask the question and let somebody else speak. So there will be no follow-ups unless you want to get back in, in line. We'll start over here and then go here. If you'll please identify yourself and uh, direct your question either to Professor Lewis or to Professor Ahmed or to both of them, and we'll proceed. First Professor of Reed. All, thank you very much to all of you and for, to the National Press Club for putting on this great event. I'd like to ask both of you gentlemen how would you suggest, in very practical terms, we can carry on this kind of a dialogue, not only here in the National Press Club, but throughout our country? We need this kind of thing. Thomas Jefferson said we have to have small public schools in wards and discussion all over the country to produce good citizens so that we can understand our differences and how to get over them to produce the good world we all hope and live for. Can you suggest practical steps? I'm delighted that American University has this chair, has provided a beginning, that Princeton University has Professor Lewis and other wonderful people dealing with Islam, teaching about, but we need much more of that in my opinion. How can you suggest we move ahead? I, if I may, will give my, an answer to part of the question. I hope every one of us here buys the books outside, not just for your library's sake, but for our ignorance's sake, and absorbs them, then tries themselves to organize dialogue, help American University to organize dialogue, 
It takes energy and thought to do what the National Press Club has done. Can you help us multiply this good work? Thank you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The only remedy for ignorance is instruction and knowledge. And uh, the only general suggestion that I can offer is that we should try to learn more about each other. This is necessary both ways. Um, I think one would hope for more translations of basic texts, um, honest translations, not carefully pre-selected passages designed to prove a point either for or against. Um, there is a vast literature in Arabic, an enormously diverse literature, and also, of course, in other languages. And I think that um, making more of this available in honest translations would be the greatest single contribution that one could make. Yes, I think um, that this is the time for serious dialogue. I know it's not possible in the mainstream media, but I believe the media must respond to this. There needs to be much more serious discussion, dialogue. People like Bernard Lewis need to be interacting with Muslims so that people in America see that there is the possibility of dialogue. There's far too little of this happening, and I'm afraid that the gaps are increasing, not decreasing. And we really need to be able to talk to each other. The media, mass media, therefore I'm grateful to the National Press Club for organizing a function like this, because I'm told C-SPAN is here, and C-SPAN of course is a great platform where people are able to in America. Okay, over here. Please identify yourself. Yeah, uh, my name is Quincy Lumsden. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer, Middle Eastern ambassador, etc. I run the risk of forgetting my question as I became more concerned about the fallen arches I was getting while I was waiting here to pose it. However, it goes to both gentlemen, and it relates to, for want of a better term, the separation of church and state. Uh, I would take it from uh, your book, Professor Lewis. You are a supporter of such separation, and uh, Professor Afar Ahmed, I assume from your comments on democracy, that you are as well. Uh, Having spent the majority of my adult life living in the Muslim world, uh, I have seen time and time again the defaulting of secular, notice I do not say democratic, secular government from providing what the people want and de facto driving them further into the mosque where the scripture and the hadith are followed. Okay. In those countries where there is no secular government. Public opinion is already there, and they say, why disturb it? My question to you both is, is there a realistic chance to separate church, using that word, and state, and could it be done from outside or only from inside? That's my question. Professor Thank Leo. you. This raises one of the fundamental historical differences between Christendom and Islamdom, if I may call it that for the moment. Um, Consider the early history of both. Christ was crucified, and his followers were a persecuted minority for three centuries before, with the conversion to Christianity of the Emperor Constantine, Christianity captured the state, and some would add was captured by the state. In Christian history, therefore, there have always been two separate institutions. There was the state concerned with government, there was the church, which had developed for centuries in opposition and was concerned with religion. And there is an ongoing relationship, sometimes cooperation, sometimes conflict, sometimes one prevailing, sometimes the other, which goes on through the centuries, culminating in the terrible religious wars of the Reformation period. And it was after that that finally they decided that the only solution was a separation of church and state which would serve both. It would prevent the churches from using the power of the state to enforce their doctrines, and it would stop the state from interfering in the affairs of the church. Now, the Islamic formative experience is totally different. And the Prophet Muhammad triumphed during his lifetime. He was not conquered or persecuted. Well, he was persecuted in the earlier stages, but in the end, he, his was a success story in modern language he succeeded in establishing a state of which he was sovereign. And he did what heads of state do. 
He promulgated laws, he dispensed justice, he made war, he made peace. So that in the sacred memories embodied in the earliest scriptures and other religious writings of Islam, there is this, how shall I put it, this interpenetration of religion and government, which has no parallel in Christendom. It has a parallel in Old Testament Judaism, but not in subsequent Judaism. That meant that this whole question of separation of church of state was meaningless in a Muslim context. There was no church in the Christian sense of that term. Uh, the mosque is a building. It's a place of study and worship. There is no great institution which you could call the mosque as the equivalent of the church in Christendom. That is until fairly recently. But we are beginning to see changes in many Muslim countries, and most dramatically in the so-called Islamic Republic of Iran, where for the first time they have accomplished what I would call the Christianization of Islamic institutions. I use that purely in an institutional, not in a moral or doctrinal sense. In Iran they have created something which never before existed in Islam, a papacy, a college of cardinals, a bench of bishops, and above all, an inquisition. And uh, I have no doubt that in due course they will also have a reformation. Separation of church and state was a Christian remedy for a Christian disease. It may be that since Muslims have now caught this Christian disease, they may consider a Christian remedy. Uh, Turkey already has official separation of religion and government. Uh, the former Soviet republics have brought it with them, so to speak. The established church there was communism. That has gone, alhamdulillah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there is no, therefore, official church in those states, though it is an issue. Elsewhere in the Muslim world, religion is still very much part of the state structure, sometimes to a greater, sometimes to a lesser extent. And this is, I would agree with you, a major issue at the present time. Uh, I would again see this slightly differently. I would, in fact, approach this through a paper I'm writing. This, as even as we speak, I'm working on it and thinking about it. A comparison between Jefferson and Jinnah. So we have two founding fathers, both believing in liberty, individual liberty, in a democratic society, both modern children of the Enlightenment, both founding nations, again, from what was the British yoke. And then we see this, the history of these two nations, one moving towards democracy, fulfillment of uh, the ideals of Jefferson, and the other struggling and not struggling very successfully. And in fact, half the history of Pakistan is spent under martial law. So again, what is going on in society? And the answers are, and this is how I approach it, that while the vision of Jinnah remains to balance democracy and Islam, modernity and tradition, and therefore explain contemporary society through the Islamic vision, in fact, the forces of feudalism, the forces of ignorance, the forces of prejudice within society thwart and abort that vision. So the struggle as I see it is not the separation of the two, as the struggle as I see it is to maintain a high moral order for public life, and that is Jefferson's vision. Jefferson would want a vision which rests in a very high ideal of the vision of his own society. And that is ideal American society. If you read the works of Jefferson, you will be struck at the high moral tone of the man, perhaps not in a theological or Christian sense in that sense, but nonetheless moral and very high moral. And this, I believe, is the real dilemma and the real struggle within the Muslim world. The real struggle, the young, high percentage of the population being young, high per percentage being illiterate, high percentage being unemployed, and therefore very impatient with ideas of democracy or stability or dialogue or even of tolerance. That is the real challenge to what we, I believe, in the Muslim world would want, that is a functioning Islamic democracy. Okay, let me tell you where we are. Normally, book wraps last about an hour, and that's uh, including the autographing. We have now been here for an hour. 
So here's what we're going to do. Uh, those who are in line now, I'm going to call on you. If you have not been in line, uh, I'm sorry. We're going to cut off the questioning. I'm going to ask you to ask short, succinct questions, and at the risk of uh, trying to get our highly educated and uh, incredible teachers. I mean, these, these, these gentlemen really want to educate. But I'm going to ask you to keep your questions, your responses a little bit more brief, uh, <coughs> because I'm sure that there are a lot of people who would uh, like to have their books signed uh, this evening. We have been so, chastised upon uh, it. Gently, I hope. Suitably. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll go over here and uh, please state your name and then ask yes, your question. Uh, my name is Dr. Malik uh, Hassan. I am an American Muslim of Pakistani origin. And the question is addressed to both uh, the teachers as you uh, characterize them. Um, I have wondered whether this whole discussion is irrelevant because this is more a conflict between the haves and have-nots of eternal conflict. For the, in the last 80 years, for the first 70 years, it was waged under communism versus the West. After the ignominious defeat of the communism, now you have the same factors which were driving the communism in clash with the West, sort of regrouping under this uh, sort of Islamic label. but. Uh, the fact of the matter is there are countries in Africa... All right, wait a minute. Wait, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, yeah. let, uh, let me ask you to, to comment on this, because I don't want a speech. Go ahead. Most of the hijackers came from comfortable middle-class backgrounds, and one could hardly call Saudi Arabia an impoverished country. <laughs> <laughs> Now we're getting down to the meat of it. <laughs> well, I note that the Marxist framework is still alive and kicking, so that's all I have to say. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Dorothy Wilner, and I'm a cultural anthropologist. I have two very brief questions. The first is to either of our teachers to what extent do you think the status of Rumi, the subordinate status, Rumi, Rumi, the subordinate status of Christians and Jews under Islam historically continues to influence the, uh, the approach toward the West, certainly of the extremists. And the second question is given the extent to which Israel absorbed Arab Jews, they were the majority during the 1970s, they and their descendants, some of them from communities that were 2,000 years old and they were expelled, why was not the same done, at least to some extent, in regard to uh, the Palestinians in refugee camps by some of the surrounding or other, even other Arab or Muslim countries? Would you want to understand? Mm -hmm. You go ahead. Um, the first question about uh, Jews and Christians under Islam, I would quote Bernard Lewis. Please read his book. <laughs> I don't have to go too far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then I don't even have to answer that. They were treated better than any minorities probably in any other civilization. And what I find remarkable is Muslim Spain, where you have Jews and Christians and Muslims living side by side, speaking similar languages, interacting in terms of ideas, knowledge, public debate, and this remarkably rich civilization. Your second question about Palestinian refugees, let me once again go back to my part of the world. Pakistan was created not in great circumstances, there was a lot of bloodshed, a lot of transfer population, an impoverished country. And yet Pakistan willingly took millions of refugees from India. Pakistan took millions of refugees subsequently, and even after the Soviet occupation, several million refugees from Afghanistan came to Pakistan, almost destroyed Pakistani culture, and yet they were welcome. So I think societies need to be much more tolerant of each other, much more tolerant of refugees and the dispossessed, and stop seeing each other in terms of Jews and Christians and Muslims. When I see a, a woman crying on television because she's lost a relative, I don't pause and say, is she a Jewish mother, or is she an Arab or a Muslim mother? To me, there's pain. And I think we need to be, move beyond our own immediate understanding or identification with our own groups. Okay. 
Um, may I take the second question first, question of refugees. The partition of the British mandated territory of Palestine in 1948 was a comparatively simple operation compared with the partition of British India in 1947. The number of refugees, of Arab refugees, according to UN statistics, was three quarters of a million, as compared with tens of millions in the partition of India and similar numbers in the reshaping of Eastern Europe in 1945. All those refugees, Poles, Germans, Hindus, Muslims, were resettled. And when asked, well, what is the difference? Why is it that the Palestinian refugees were not resettled but are now fourth generation stateless aliens in Arab countries? And the answer that most readily comes to my mind, I hope I'm wrong, but it seems to me the only one I can think of, is that the United Nations organization was not involved in either the East European or the Indian in Indo Pak partition. <laughs> On the question of tolerance, yes. Um, tolerance is a very intolerant idea. Tolerance means basically, I'm in charge. I will allow you some, though not all, of the privileges which I enjoy, provided that you behave yourself according to rules that I will lay down. And that is the nature of the dhimma to which you referred. Now, tolerance is much better than intolerance. And, uh, the practice of Muslim states represented a vast improvement on what was normal elsewhere, and particularly in the Christian world. It did not represent a vast improvement on polytheism, because polytheism by its very nature is tolerant of other gods. You can have as many gods as you like, it doesn't matter. But once you get to a monotheistic religion, um, they tend to fall into the I'm right, you're wrong, go to hell category. Um, Muslim tolerance was vastly greater than anywhere in Christendom until the wars of religion. Uh, you know, people often try to draw a parallel between the Ottoman-European confrontation and the Cold War of the late 20th century. In many respects, a valid parallel, but I would remind you that then the movement of refugees was overwhelmingly from west to east, not from east to west. However, once you pass the wars of religion and the introduction of separation of church and state, then tolerance in that sense, some but not all, provided you behave yourself, is no longer acceptable by modern democratic standards. And this is where the difficulty and the misunderstandings arise. My name is Fidai Awalarabe, chairman of the Atatürk Society of America. And I did read the uh, a lot of books about the uh, Bernard Lewis, and he mentioned the Ataturks many times in his books, and also Musharraf of the Pakistan. He likes to implement the peace in the world. If he would have implemented the Ataturk philosophy, uh, separate the church and state, we wouldn't have an all this September 11. My question is this. Uh, <clears throat> the problem with the Muslim world, I think, so when I was a little boy growing up, We've been brainwashed by the uh, Arabic scripture from the uh, Quran because we didn't know anything about it until I arrived in America first time. I raised my voice and uh, about Islam. And then I changed all entire my life because we learned to not to like the Christian and Jews. That's what we taught when we were growing up. We called them infidel. Now, the, how could you have a peace and democracy if your Quran says in my the chapter 5, uh, verses says 51, do not make friends from Jew and Christians. Okay. Bernard, that one is Bernard, for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the privilege of the senior person to pass it on to the junior one. <laughs> These verses and others similar to them are indeed from the Quran. They're taken out of context. Please read the second and third verse after this. They like the verses about marriage. Uh, I'm surprised that question hasn't come up. They may be coming up in the next, uh, from the next question is, how are Muslims allowed to marry four times? Again, read the verse immediately after this. Whether the verses are talking about fighting, not only Jews and Christians, but Muslims also, it is in a specific context where God, again, is telling the individual to stand up and fight for principles, to fight for Islam as a faith. God is telling a man that, yes, in a situation you can marry one, two, three, four, but, and this second verse is never quoted, 
one wife is the best best marriage and ma best marriage arrangement that is possible because you cannot treat four women in the same way possible. So I would say two things. Number one, please see these verses in their cultural context. And secondly, step back and look at the spirit of the Quran. I will now throw some verses at you when you talk about the Quran, talking about the Jews and the Christians. There are references to Jesus Christ repeatedly throughout the Quran. There's an entire chapter on Mary. Throughout the Quran, the, the Quran talks about treating Christians with special affection. It talks about the Jews and the Christians as people of the book. There are references to Moses, there are references to Abraham. How can then you say that Muslims do not like Jews and Christians? Every Muslim, every prayer five times a day must give benediction and pray for Abraham and the descendants of Abraham. So how can you then throw one verse which is set in a particular cultural context and expect that religion to be anti-Jewish or anti-Christian. Yes, the Muslims in the Muslim world are making exactly the mistake that you have made, which is to select one particular line and not the second, third lines of that particular verse and then apply it. That is what Osama bin Laden has been doing so successfully. Professor Lewis? Yes, I think we all know that it is possible to, do, to work miracles with sacred texts. Uh, and I mean in the sense of interpretation and reinterpretation. Um, according to Muslim doctrine, the Quran is divine, eternal, uncreated, and unchangeable. Um, according to reformers and others, it's a text of the 7th century, which is inevitably outdated by the subsequent development of attitudes, morals, science, and the rest. Um, here you have a serious dilemma which Muslims have to confront. Uh, just as Christians and Jews have to confront the same dilemma in dealing with their own scriptures. Um, I don't wish to bet, get impaled on that particular dilemma here. Okay. My name is Bob Manning, and I have no particular credentials, but I do have an interest in education and the importance of education. Uh, it seems that much education throughout the Islamic world has been captured by fundamentalists who really aren't interested in teaching nuance or skills needed for a modern society. And I'm wondering, one, is my impression true? Two, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? And uh, what your perspective is on it? Let me give you an imaginary parallel. Imagine that the Ku Klux Klan or the Aryan Nation or some equivalent movement was suddenly to come into the possession of unlimited wealth and use that money to establish a network of well-endowed schools and colleges all over Christendom, peddling their particular brand of Christianity. That will give you an approximate idea of what has happened in the world of Islam. The Wahhabis are a branch, a rather extreme and radical branch of Islam, an Ara a minority even in Arabia, confined on the whole to Najd, with very limited impact elsewhere. Oil revenues, have made it possible for the Wahhabis to promote and propagate their particular version of Islam all over the Islamic world and even among Muslim minorities in non-Muslim countries. I think the parallel may serve to explain what has happened. Um, in this, as in many other respects, oil has been a curse. It has certainly made this kind of Islamic fundamentalism, so-called, a major movement in the Islamic world when without oil and oil money, it would otherwise have been a lunatic fringe in a marginal country. Again, I want to approach this as an anthropologist from my own experience of growing up in North Pakistan in a Christian school called Burn Hall, run by Catholic priests. Now, the relationship we had, and I know Catholic priests are getting this terrible press here in America these days, but they were, for us, great models. They were hardworking, they were honest, they were pious people, and great warmth and great affection for the students. And we called them fathers and we respected them. And yet, in the 1990s, this sort of 30, 40 years on, I find the same society, the same society persecuting Christians to the point where a bishop killed himself in Pakistan in despair. So something is changing in society. Something is changing in attitudes to education. The same westernized schools that were the um, platform from which you had a vision of a modern Muslim society were now marginalized. 
other schools had come up, other schools which were now teaching thousands and thousands and thousands of young men who are in turn going on to Afghanistan to fight a jihad or become the Taliban and supporting people like the Taliban with a very fixed vision of the world. And these were products of the madrasa. Now, there's a dilemma that the madrasa itself is absolutely legitimate, it's part of society, it simply means a school. Every village has a madrasa. If you were to close the madrasas, this would be a calamity in the Muslim world. At the same time, the reformation of the madrasa, the bringing the madrasa into line with the modern world, the teaching of the teachers, the interchange of teachers coming out from, say, countries like Pakistan to perhaps Egypt or to America or to, to Europe, so that they in turn are able to inculcate a broad vision of a world to the student which is in harmony with the rest of the world. I think that is crucial. Again, it's dangerous to simplify, it is dangerous to dismiss, it is dangerous to debunk. We need to understand what is going on in the Muslim world and then stay, take steps to help it along so that it becomes part of the community of nations. Okay, no, no, no I'm sorry. Uh, over here, please. Yes. Hello, my name is Russell Mokhyber. I have a question for Professor Lewis. Um, the British press reported in 1997 that um, your views on the killing of one million Armenians by the Turks in 1915 did not amount to genocide, that your view was it was not genocide. And this report in the Independent of London says that a French court fined you one dollar in damages after you were, after you said one that franc. there was no, no Armenian, one franc, I'm sorry, after you said there was um, no Armenian genocide. My, uh, and this triggered, obviously, uh, a debate in Israel where, uh, in this, according to this article... Can uh, you, I'm sorry, can you uh, ask your question, please? We're running out of time. The question is, sir, um, have your views changed on this, whether the killing of one million Armenians amounts to genocide, and your views on the court judgment? This is a question of definition. And nowadays, the word genocide is used very loosely, even in cases where no bloodshed is involved at all and I can understand the annoyance of those who find it refused. But in this particular case, the point that was being made was that the massacre of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire was the same as what happened to the Jews in Nazi Germany. And that is a downright falsehood. What happened to the Armenians was the result of a massive Armenian armed rebellion against the Turks, which began even before war broke out and continued on a larger scale. Um, great numbers of Armenians, including members of the armed forces, deserted, crossed the frontier, and joined the Russian forces invading Turkey. Armenian rebels actually seized the city of Van and held it for a while, intending to hand it over to the invaders. Um, there was guerrilla warfare all over Anatolia. I mean, this was what we nowadays call a national liberation movement of the Armenians against Turkey. And uh, the Turks certainly resorted to very ferocious methods in repelling it. There is clear evidence of a decision by the Turkish government to deport the Armenian population from the sensitive areas, which meant virtually the whole of Anatolia, uh, not including the Arab provinces, which were then still part of the Ottoman Empire. There is no evidence of a decision to massacre. Um, on the contrary, there is considerable evidence of attempts to prevent it, which were not very successful. Yes, there were tremendous massacres. The numbers are very uncertain, but a million may well be likely. Uh, the massacres were carried out by irregulars, by local villagers responding to what had been done to them, and in a number of other ways. But to make this a parallel with the Holocaust in Germany, you would have to assume that the Jews of Germany had been engaged in an armed rebellion against the German state, collaborating with the Allies against Germany, that in the deportation order, the cities of Hamburg and Berlin were exempted, uh, that persons in the employment of the state were exempted, and that the deportation only applied to the Jews of Germany proper, so that when they got to Poland, they were welcomed and sheltered by the Polish Jews. This seems to me a rather absurd parallel. Okay, uh, I'm going to go over here. My name is Anne Wilner. I'm a political scientist. My question is to Professor Ahmad. Uh, I couldn't help noticing that throughout your talk, you used the term Muslim society in the singular 
rather than in the plural. Now, in my work and study in the largely Muslim country of Indonesia, I could not help noticing that the Muslim Achenis, the Muslim Javanese, the Muslim Madhuris, and I may go further, all are represented in many ways different subcultures and in many ways their own kiais, as the Javanese call them, or schoolmen, interpreted Islam somewhat differently. So perhaps my question, the question I was going to ask you, was in part answered by Professor Lewis. But I would like to ask you that in how many or what kinds of Muslim societies do you believe the Wahhabi version of Islam has greatly penetrated in recent years? Well, this is a genuine question, again, of definition. Uh, it's uh, shorthand to talk of Muslim society. You're absolutely right. Muslim societies are not mo a monolith. In fact, they're very varied. Uh, you have Muslim societies in California. You have them in New York. You have them in Washington. You have them in Cairo, in Karachi. They speak different languages. They eat foods which are different. They have different clothes. They wear, have different marriage customs. Again, as an anthropologist, I'm fascinated by the differences. At the same time, there is an overarching sense of identity. In fact, Muslims themselves use the notion of the ummah, which is the community of believers. And in that sense, there is a Muslim society. It's an idea. You're right. On the ground, in anthropological terms, it's nonsense. But it exists in the minds of people. So when you talk of Muslim society as a shorthand, we talk about it in terms of a definition to explain the world today. Uh, it's similarly uh, nonsense to talk about Western civilization. How can you say America and France and uh, Britain, all these uh, Western nations are, are one in terms of one civilization. At the same time, there is an overarching idea of a civilization. So in that sense, I use the word Muslim society. I, in fact, point out in the beginning of the book that I'm using these shorthands, and I point out the pitfalls of using them. Thank you. Thank you. OK, this is going to be the last question. Thank you very much. My name is Bert Keidel. My question's for um, Professor Lewis. Uh, Professor Ahmed can comment, I hope. Uh, you've left us hanging a little bit, I dare say. Your conclusion about the 17th century was that the uh, great loss at Vienna uh, and its causes seem to be something that came from Islam itself and wasn't something that was put onto them. And then you said, and this might apply to other uh, situations as well, and that left us hanging. In the 20th century, um, what would you say was the impact on the Middle East of the uh, partition of the Ottoman Empire by the British and the French, uh, and the occupation, uh, the military occupation of various important cities in the region, and then the horrible Holocaust, which propelled a, a, a homeland to grow with even more fervor than would have been there, perhaps, to begin with, uh, did, and, and the consequent conflicts. Was this something that was imposed on uh, the Middle East, and particularly on Palestine, or was it something that uh, they brought on themselves? The expansion of the European imperial powers at the expense of the Islamic lands, the spread of European domination in the Islamic world, um, reached its culmination in 1918 with the defeat of the Ottoman Empire, the occupation of its, capi of its capital by Allied troops, and the partition of its provinces among the victorious Allied powers. Um, it was to this that Osama bin Laden referred in one of his statements when he said, for more than 80 years, we have suffered shame and humiliation. This sent the journalists, the intelligence officers, and the foreign office types scurrying to the libraries to find out what precisely he could be referring to. I'm sure that everybody in his audience knew exactly what he was referring to. Um, the defeat of the Ottoman Empire, the breakup of the last great Islamic state in 1918 was the lowest point, the nadir of this long drawn out struggle in which Christendom was coming to dominate Islamdom. Uh, before that, for almost a thousand years, the Muslims had dominated. Muslim armies were invading Europe, first in Spain and Sicily, then in Russia, then in the Balkans. And then gradually, and then suddenly, things turned round. It was a reversal of a process which, to be fair, began on the other side. And that reached its culmination in 1918, as I said, when 
virtually the whole of the Muslim world, with two or three exceptions, was incorporated in the great colonial empires of Britain, France, the Netherlands, and Russia, smaller pieces to Italy and uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, the struggle against imperialism, <clears throat> which began very soon after that, is another and final phase. Now, to blame the imperial powers for what went wrong makes as much sense as to blame the Mongols for what went wrong. Um, the imperial powers were successful in this struggle, which the European powers did not open, did not begin. Uh, they were attacked, they responded. They expelled the invaders, and then they followed the invaders whence they had come. Um, when the question I think that one has to ask, and which they should be asking, and many of them are asking, is not why did they attack us, that is obvious, but why did they succeed? Why did we fail? That, I think, is the helpful line of inquiry. And that, uh, Professor Lewis, you have the last word. Uh, Professor Lewis and Professor Ahmed, I would like to thank you for speaking tonight as part of the National Press Club's Book Wrap series and offer each of you the highly coveted National Press Club coffee mug as a token of our appreciation. And now, if uh, you would like to have your books autographed, if you will please line up in this direction. is the author of Islam Today. It's published by Palgrave Macmillan. Visit palgrave.com to get more information. And Bernard Lewis's latest work is called What Went Wrong? Western Impact and Middle Eastern Response. It's published by Oxford University Press. And you can visit oup.com to get more information.